Have you ever heard of Baluchistan? Baluchistan? Yes. No. No. Baluchistan. Sorry. Baluchistan? Um. Baluchi. Baluchistan. No. No. Have you ever heard of Baluchistan? No. No? Okay. Uh, no, I don't think so. No. Okay. Well, it's about oh, Baluchi. It's a. Uh, the fish eggs. Or not? Baluchistan? Baluchistan. No. Sorry? Baluchistan. No. No, sorry. Well, Baluchistan is the largest province of Pakistan. However, for the Baluch people, it isn't. For them, it's their country. Concerning this issue, the Baluch people fight for independence in a conflict with the Pakistani government and army. Sorry, we are starting a little bit late, but um, we're all happy that you're here um, and that you are interested in listening to <laughs> um, yeah, all of our speakers today. Um, and we hope you learned something. But And our first speaker is Hamal. Um, yeah, he's actually from Balochistan, and he's going to give a little introduction in case you don't, you're not very familiar um, with the situation. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to tell you the history of Balochistan. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is Balochistan. The pink area is the territory of Balochistan, where around 23 million pe Baloch people live, and they call this beautiful land their homeland. So, this small grid. Uh, area as the eastern part of Balochistan, which is <coughs> under Pakistani occupation, and uh, there are around 18 million people living here. In uh, 1866, a set of Baloch tribes uh, created Khan of Karat, which was ruled by a Khan, and the first Khan of Karat was Mir Ahmad Yar Khan. And uh, he was selected by a set of tribal groups because Balochistan uh, has been for centuries a tribal area. But this was the first time that Baloch uh, formally uh, created their own country. So this was Balochistan before the advent of uh, British colonizer and uh, before other before the other occupiers and colonizers were there. So they had a country. In 1839, British colonizers needed this land because they had to travel through Baluchistan and to go uh, to go to Afghanistan because their interests uh, lie there. They wanted to uh, occupy Afghanistan and uh, uh, rule uh, Afghanistan in order to prevent uh, the Russian. Uh, Powers to come into Afghanistan and to reach the warm water of Balochistan. So they used this land, they had to occupy Balochistan. So they fought a war against Baloch people and killed the Baloch Khan in 1839 and made Balochistan part of the uh, British Empire. On 11th of August 1947, Balochistan gained its independence. And it enjoyed its independence for about seven months. But in 1948, 27th March 1948, Pakistan forcefully annexed Balochistan. And since then, Baloch people have been fighting. Thank you so much. The opinions about the annexation of Baluchistan by Pakistan are split. The Pakistani government of course doesn't agree 
that Baluchistan was forcefully annexed. In their opinion, Baluchistan itself chose to join Pakistan. This idea is based on the fact that the Khan signed an agreement to join Pakistan. However, many people state that this wasn't a free choice. What complicates the conflict is the fact that the Baluchistan territory is rich in natural resources, which are important for Pakistan. The province with the highest number of inhabitants in Pakistan, Punjab, relies on gas from Baluchistan. A big part of the Baluch people, however, don't have any access to electricity or gas from their own province at all. This unequal division of resources makes the voice raised by the Baluch for independence still stronger. Next we're going to have Susanna Koster, who is a research journalist and she is specialized in um, Pakistan, so she's going to tell us about Balochistan from her point of view. The picture below is a hunger strike against missing persons. In Balochistan there are grave human rights violations and one of them, and that's also the reason why it's not completely dead in the international media, uh, there are a lot of uh, disappearances. Um, the numbers range from a few hundred to thousands, and we simply don't know, because there is a count, but every organization have, has you know, different access, so we don't know exactly. But uh, the police is picking them up here um, uh, and trying to get them uh, away, away from the spotlight. Now, sometimes uh, people do um, hold talks in Pakistan on Baluchistan, or, or they try to. What's happening in media, but also people who try to highlight this issue, they get a call from intelligence agents uh, uh, to um, stop the reporting or not report on this. They get guidance. It's called guidance. It's not going uh, along with threats or you'll die or whatever. But um, uh, journalists have died in very mysterious circumstances, also in Baluchistan. And people are really, really very scared. I, I wanted to give you this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, uh, we have Taj Baloch. He is a Baloch refugee in Sweden and the chairman of the Human Rights Council of Balochistan. Enforced disappearances started in 2001. The number of missing persons is Susanna spoke. Nobody knows how many are missing. They are just some numbers which are believable. In 2004, the Home Minister of Pakistan declared that they have arrested around 4,000 persons in Pakistan, and everybody believed it because it looked believable. Then in 2010, somebody told that 20,000 people are missing in Pakistan. So it was believable whoever was looking at Baluchistan. Then in 2017, the number reached 45,000 missing persons in Baluchistan, and people just believe it because it looks like believable. No one knows how many, how many people are extraditionally killed in Baluchistan. It's not possible to know it until a big organization is not involved. 2006, we started working, 289 in 2016, 187 in 2017, 256 in 2018. So we could see 732 people extrajudicially killed by military and security forces in six districts of Baluchistan out of 32 districts. When they come in a village, I'm sorry, I have to show you some small radios I'm trying to make it as short as possible. This is small village, military has reached, and they just took all the men from the houses. Then they took all the valuables from the houses, and when they're leaving, they have to burn whatever entire things they have. And they're telling the people that God gave you more, don't worry for this. Thank you very much. Maybe someone see this and... <laughs> How is Pakistan at the moment reacting to the wish of the Baluch people 
to be independent? Okay, yeah, it's mean um, if I, I, I said that I want independence, yeah, I, I, uh, I said I want independence, then uh, it's mean I want, oh, come kill me. Uh, because of th th this point, we want pre Baluchistan and our p our people being I, I become a systematic genocide uh, Pakistani uh, authorities are doing in Balochistan. I think most countries have an army uh, they say in Pakistan the army has a country so the army is not just there to protect the citizens or supposedly so but it also has a huge conglomerate of, of companies building companies, uh, flower companies, uh, uh, banks, all sorts of things. And these are assets they want to protect. And China, the, you know, the business with China, is also such a yeah, business model where the, the army has an interest. So the, the issue in, in Baluchistan has complicated a lot. And I think that you can see also in the human rights abuses. The interests have gone up and the human rights right up abuses have, have also come up. The UN has repeatedly asked the government to ratify that international convention for the protection of all persons from enforced disappearance, for instance. The UN had sent this working group to Balochistan, uh, where obviously it needs the cooperation of the government. It needs, uh, an inf it, the UN asked a government to invite them, and the government has to ask, uh, it gives that invitation. The UN cannot just barge on somebody's door and, and step in because it's obviously the combined nations then stepping on your doorstep. So um, there are attempts, but it's um, uh, it, it's just really difficult in Pakistan, considering the army having this hold. And one of my one of my elder friend Zakir, he was coming, going to his house and near to the. Near to near to his house in the in the city, and uh, he was abducted, in the in the way he did not reach at home. Since at at June two thousand nine till now, it's gonna ten years. Yeah, he is missing. The UN also took his case. He, uh, he, um, um, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, all the organization took his case that please release him and uh, urgent action, the pressure on Pakistan, but then they are not release him yet. When our, um, uh, our we stop our car, but my father was driving and, and asked me, who is car this? My father told me, this is my car. I said, no, it's not your car. Who is the owner of this car? I said, I am the, my father told me, I am the owner of this car. No, no, someone else. Sometimes we, we bring banners and play card with the car, the speaker. We use car to bring this speaker for, for, for uh, demonstration. Then my father came to home and I saw him that he is... Is coming without car. He asked my brother, where is car? Say, the army arrest our car. Say, why? Then, then you say they want the owner. Say, owner mean? You are the owner of the car. Say, no, I think they are looking after you. In the past time, I know that the army know me, and they are looking after me. I don't want to leave my my, my country, my friends, my people, my my childhood, my, my all of things, my, my everything. And uh, I never think, I never ever think to, to leave my country and to, to stay away from, from this, my land. In my own wish, I said today I can fly and go to the Uzbekistan. I have many friends which now today they are not with us, they are not alive. They have been abducted by army, tortured and killed by army.
like when i was left in bolchistan uh, i was living bolchistan and there was um our on our power friend kamar chakar he was really a good friend of mine and before his abduction uh, and this and the evening up with tomorrow tonight is gonna abduct uh, uh, being abducted in the evening time i was going to the market i saw uh, kamar is standing to a uh, kamar is coming to his house and then i met him and we stand and we talk and we make pun and like um we discuss about many organization things on on the on the and the same place and he was abducted once before um and he was released like three months for what now he was in, in in the in the area and he told me i was being tortured like many things he told me and uh, say i told him yeah you were one here you are missing you did not know what happened to us and outside now the situation is really tough and uh, like 20 minutes or half an hour we we speak in the same night he came back and he was going to bed and the army raided his house and he and his cousin was abducted and he was really brutally brutally tortured his body and yeah i can not saw the body body then then they in the same month i left balochistan So now our point is not if Balochistan should be independent or not because we could discuss about all the political aspects of that for quite some time but what we do want to make clear is that what's happening to the people of Balochistan is not okay like in the cases of Zakhar Kumbar and Kia it is not in line with the human rights and that is what needs awareness because we as humans can do something to help them